gospel. Today I'm going to be sharing some thoughts from Matthew chapter 15. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there now. I'm going to read them to you. I'll not read the whole chapter, but I will read most of it. From verse 1. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honour your father and mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, Whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is a gift devoted to God, he is not to honour his father with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites! Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean, but what comes out of his mouth. That is what makes him unclean. Then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when, you, when they heard this? He replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into a pit. Peter said, Explain the parable to us. Are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and these make a man unclean. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what make a man unclean. But eating with unwashed hands does not make him unclean. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffer suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Jesus has already frustrated the Jewish elites in chapters 8 and 9. When he touched a leper, he visited Gentile territory with herds of pigs and unclean demons. He's made contact with a, a woman who's suffering from a menstrual disorder. He's even touched a dead body to say nothing of his refusal, refusal to social distance himself from tax collectors and sinners. Here in chapter 15, he breaks the barriers of Jewish purity laws again. He travels to a non-Jewish territory, meets a Canaanite woman and expels her daughter's evil spirit. And then he even shares what they called Israel's bread with the dogs. All I need to tell you to explain the massive significance of what Jesus does here to upset the Pharisees is to say that they took ritual purity extremely seriously. They did, however, ignore the need for mercy, something that God always emphasized in the Old Testament law. And they even added their own laws and interpretations to the ritual laws of the Old Testament. Pharisees believed you could only participate in worship of God as his holy people set apart for him if you avoided eating and drinking certain things or being in close contact with sick people or touching other unclean things. And without getting into a detailed explanation of the Pharisees' argument and Jesus' counter-argument, we'll simply look at what Jesus is teaching them and us in verses 17 to 20 mainly. Basically, these religious leaders came all the way from Jerusalem to accuse and criticise Jesus by holding him responsible for the fact that his disciples were not washing their hands in a certain way before they ate. Problem was, the Old Testament law that they supposedly were following, never actually required ordinary Jews to wash their hands. That was a law that people added themselves. So Jesus doesn't even deal directly with their question. Instead, he responds with another question. They say in verse 2, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? Jesus says, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? 
So he actually points out their own hypocrisy. He doesn't deal with this accusation. Because here's the big problem. Their heart. They cared far more for their own traditions than for God's commandments. It was not holiness that they were aiming for, but ego. God was not impressed with their well-sanitized hands. He was looking at their hearts, and what he saw was an empty, dark, sinful heart of stone, devoid of mercy or love. That's why Jesus quotes the words of Isaiah to them, words they would have been well acquainted with. He says, These people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. 700 years had passed since these words were spoken of Israel. And yet, they were still an appropriate rebuke for God's people who should have known better. Now, you and I can look at this situation <clears throat> and we can think we're far removed from it. You'd never judge someone for how they wash their hands. Well, now that I think about it, Maybe there's never been more judging about how someone washes their hands in all of our nation's history. But take that example. Expand it from the current health crisis to other mundane things. You wouldn't judge someone for eating pork or for not eating fish, etc., would you? But we're not Jewish, so we can't fully put ourselves in their shoes here. And yet, that isn't really the point. Because as I said, the Pharisees had created their own laws. Their laws were made to restrict people, not to bless people. God's laws have always been an expression of his love toward his people. Israel had laws that, that we have never had to live under because Jesus came to fulfill the law and the dietary laws have been abolished for us. But we still need to obey God's laws with a heart of appreciation for them. And what if we are professing to be Christians? But our lives do not reflect any reality in our claim. What if we say our Christ we are Christians, but the ordinary person would hardly notice much difference between how we live compared with them? <coughs> Hypocrisy is what Jesus is getting at. Hypocrisy is a deadly poison for evangelism. How can we hope to share the gospel with someone if we've not been living by it? How can we hope to share God's love with people if all they can see in us is contradictions and pride, well, maybe you are fooling people very well. Maybe you've been going to church for a long time and you've convinced people pretty good that you are converted, but deep down, it's all a charade, it's all a mask. Well, God is not fooled. Look at verses 12 and 13 again. <coughs> Excuse me. The disciples ask if Jesus realised how powerful his words are, how greatly he had offended these religious elites. His response? Every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Or in other words, Jesus says, yes, I know very well how offended they are. And I also know that they're not saved. They have no faith, only empty works, and they are not my father's children, so they will be uprooted. Later, Jesus would use similar imagery in the parable of the vineyard, where he says that those wretches will be brought to a wretched end. And you can use your own imagination to work out what he's referring to there in terms of hell. Big claims, big words, strong words, powerful words. But Jesus doesn't take hypocrisy or fake obedience lightly. It's a serious offence against God to act as if he can't see your heart. He isn't the blind one here. The Pharisees are. That's why Jesus calls them blind guides leading the blind. That's where we get that phrase from. The terrible thing is if the blind lead the blind, they both fall into the pit. And Jesus cares for his people. And this is such a dreadful offence to him because the Pharisees were leading other people astray with them. But despite Jesus' harsh rebukes here, look at how massive his heart is in the next section. He teaches that what comes from the heart matters most. And now he proves the tender, loving kindness of his own heart. Matthew says, a Canaanite woman comes to Jesus. Canaanites were Israel's most persistent enemies throughout their history. 
And here there's one with a demon-possessed daughter. She's coming crying to Jesus. He knows he's upset the Pharisees already, so how's he going to respond to this woman? Any patience they have left for him will surely be extinguished if he even lets the woman anywhere near him. See, if there was an award for socially distancing from people outside your social and cultural sphere, the Pharisees would have won it. Well, Jesus doesn't care what man thinks of him. His mission is from his father. Isaiah 42 says, He came as a light to the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. And so Jesus does heal the woman's daughter, despite at first refusing her request. He subtly and mysteriously is teaching her a lesson about faith here. Or in fact, he lets her teach herself a lesson about faith. She passes the test successfully, and she's persistent with Jesus, pleading with him for help and demonstrating that she knows she's helpless without him. In response, he's more than willing to bless her, and even says her faith is great. That's the only time that such a compliment is given by Jesus in the whole of Matthew's Gospel. So what was so great about her faith? Didn't Jesus refer to her as a dog? Well, firstly, he simply states that his initial mission is to God's people, the Israelites, but he would be a light for the revelation of the Gentiles too. He's not being rude in calling her a dog. He uses a Greek word for a house pet or a puppy. And uh, so he's simply saying that he came to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. But her faith is so great because she completely accepts that she is no better than a dog. She is as unclean, as un uh, as helpless, as reliant upon her master for even the most basic necessities like food. And she has no greater status than that of a dog. And that's actually the recipe for accepting Christ as master. We first confess our unworthiness, our sinfulness, and our inability to help ourselves. We must recognise that we're no more than weak puppies before God. Then we need to plead with Christ for forgiveness and ask him to save us as we are, clothe us in his purity and goodness, and save us from our own sin. We cannot change our own hearts by keeping certain rules or rituals. We can't please God by pleasing people. We can't please God at all unless we are planted by him. We need the Lord to change our hearts, thereby transforming us from the inside out. He will never cast us away. He will never refuse that request. Verse 28. Then Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Salvation is instantaneous. We cannot work our way to it. Only by faith in Christ can we be saved. If you're trusting in Christ as your saviour, obey him as your master, not for the sake of tradition, ritual, or for pride, but because you love him and you want to please him. Don't fall into hypocrisy, expecting other people to be perfect when you know you're just as flawed and as broken as they are. Next time you get the hand sanitizer out, remember Jesus' words. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. Now I'm not saying you shouldn't wash your hands properly, but just like any other thing you do, what comes from the inside is more important than what is seen on the outside. Germs are an invisible enemy, but sin is a much more nefarious enemy, and it cannot be hidden from God. And if you've never put your faith in him, you need to see just how broken and helpless you are. Like the woman in the chapter, you're in a great need of help from the Lord, and he is willing to give it. He is mighty to save. Amen.